Hi, I'm Owen from REST Australia. Thanks for tuning in to the REST Network. Before we get into today's show, there are a few things we have to go over. Firstly, what you're about to hear and see is limited to general information only. It's not personal financial advice like you'd get from a financial planner. Also, it's important to remember that past performance is not indicative of future performance. That means that anything that's happened in the past, or we say today, is not necessarily going to reflect what happens in the future. Lastly, please consider that any of the guests or myself are featuring on this program may have a financial interest in some of the products or shares mentioned. That's enough from me. I hope you enjoyed today's program. Uh, g'day, guys. Welcome to this episode of the Australian Investors Podcast. This is our Investor Bootcamp mini series. And today we're talking about our favorite Twitter accounts. I'm joined by Danielle Ikuyo. How are you going? I'm good. Thanks, Owen. How are you? Very good. Very good. It's a lot more sunny down here in Melbourne than it is in Sydney. So I've got that one um, over you for now. Uh, speaking of a, a fellow Sydney cider or just outside Sydney, uh, Anir Ban Mahanti, how are you, mate? I'm good, man. How are you? Very good. I'm not so- sunny. That's except for everything else. <laughs> Uh, yeah, and you do sound a little bit nasally. Hopefully, it's not um, anything too sinister. So I hope you're feeling well, mate. Um, let's just say, let's just blame it on the weather. Uh, we're, we're talking in uh, investor Twitterati today. Basically, we're talking about people that um, tend to lurk on Twitter. Um, there was news out this week, not to timestamp it too much, but Elon Musk took a took a pretty big stake in Twitter. Uh, seems like the world's working up to its potential. We've been there, all three of us have been there for quite a while talking about investing. And I use Twitter, I don't know about you two, but I use Twitter as a great information source for companies to follow really um, prolific investors. And what I've found is Twitter does a really good job of breaking down the barriers to really interesting people. And it's surprising who will respond to you when you ask a question. Um, I don't know if either of you guys have had that experience when you're learning or you're discovering something new. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. I'm always um, I'm always a bit shy, but uh, I've had um, lovely responses from certain people. And uh, it seems to me that it's, it's very much a, for most people, people on there. Obviously, if you've got 320,000 followers, it's really hard to respond to every comment. Mm. Some of the people that I follow have that many. But a lot of them respond and they're generally keen to help people understand things. And yeah, so I think it's, I think it's a, a, by and large, it's a great community. But like every social media platform, you just have to watch out for conspiracy theories, echo chambers, yada, yada, yada. Mm-hmm. Hence why somebody has brought, probably bought in to the share register. <laughs> <laughs> Indeed. And um, it is, it's such a great tool. I know Seven Investing uh, nearby, I knew you guys have used it for spaces in the past uh, where mm-hmm. you can actually jive, uh, join live conversations or host your own. It's kind of like this podcast, but with hundreds, if not thousands of other people listening at the same time. Have those been pretty effective for you guys? Yeah, the spaces are more, um, you know, this, they're like, impromptu right impromptu discussions they really work well if it's something is a topical you know like uh, oh the fed has increased the uh, the rates right that's going to drive a lot of interest um, among you know listeners uh, potential listeners and those people might show up to talk about that or something big happens like um, you know, let's say, uh, you know, Tesla has, uh, you know, delivered some gazillion number of cars and people are interested to talk about it. You know, it, it really depends on uh, the news of the day. The spaces are good for that sort of thing. Then, and then, of course, I've seen, um, so the spaces that Seven Investing has done has been mostly around like topics, uh, news of the day and, and things like that. Um, there are also spaces around uh, companies and company specific discussions or even macro specific discussions those mm. actually some of those can can have thousands of people actually mm. listen mm. to it um you know simultaneously um i'm ambivalent on on spaces my my preference on twitter and unlike the two of you i've never had the fortune of having an answer from someone uh, you know a personalized answer <laughs> to my tweet or a question so nobody's actually bothered to answer anything to me um, but, but the way I've looked at Twitter always is Twitter is sort of a one-to-many dissemination platform, right? So, you know, people, there are people who are broadcasting stuff, right? And it's a great way to, you know, catch on to the broadcast that you're interested in 
and great way to learn from multiple people as exactly as as you as you said and it's a great source for finding interesting people so i've found some mm. very interesting people that i wouldn't have found otherwise mm. and uh, you know from these people i've learned things that i wouldn't have learned otherwise because that sort of information is not there in the books or in traditional media or um you know just in a different way or different lens of looking at things right mm. um, so yeah it's it's a very very cool medium um, there's a lot of bad stuff in it as well, but as, 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 you have, as you have indicated already, but like that's true for most things. So I find it, it's, it's a very good learning tool. Mm. Personally, for me, that's my main usage. I, I do tweet about stuff, but for me, I'm more a receiver mm. of information. Mm. Personally, and I, that's, that's where it's very, very useful for me. Mm. Can, can I just add about spaces? Because I came across this guy called George Noble. He's not on our list that we'll discuss, but he's an interesting character who used to work uh, at Fidelity, the Magellan Fund, uh, with Peter Lynch, if my memory mm. serves me, correct me. So dare I say he's he's older than me. He's got the most amazing collection of contacts because he started in the industry and the late 70s, early 80s, and he had in one of his spaces, and they're pretty out there. He kind of plays Eagles music and <laughs> sometimes he does it in a pizza bar and, you know, he's an American dude that's been around a long time in financial markets, but he had Dennis Gartman on there who's kind of like a legend. And uh, for someone like me who's heard about this guy, he stopped his newsletter because sadly he's got Parkinson's, but he did a presentation around Dennis Gartman's rules. So your listeners, viewers can actually Google them and they're very, very informative. But it was just amazing to, you know, I think I was there at the gym and I'm kind of doing my workout actually listening to Dennis Gartman. So uh, it's it's a case sometimes that you really can strike it lucky when you get the ability to hear legends talking live in that space format. Mm. Yeah, it is indeed. Um, this is a relatively new thing for Twitter. They seem to be very slow on innovation, so hopefully Mr. Musk can sort that out. <laughs> I will also just make a special mention that it didn't take us five minutes to bring in Tesla, um, and it took us less than that to talk about Elon. So that's great. We're, we're true to form, guys. Um, so we're going to go through at least five uh, Twitter handles that uh, each of us like or follow. Um, and maybe if, as we go through, we can just spend maybe say 30 to 60 seconds saying why we like it. And the idea here is that any of our listeners who don't already follow these channels or these people uh, can do that and they know what they're going to, then they're signing up for. I find one great thing to do is actually to find people, find people you like and see who they follow or see what they're retweeting too. And it's a really great kind of like follow on uh, from that. So Danny, why don't we start with you? What's, what's your number one uh, Twitter handle? Uh, none of these are actually in order, That's okay. uh, but I, I generally, I, particularly at the moment, given the way markets are um, being very macroeconomic driven, uh, I follow somebody called David Rosenberg, who used to be the chief economist at Merrill Lynch. He's gone out on his own for quite a, a, a many years, and he has Rosenberg Research. And he's very, very thorough. He is known as a bit of a bear, but I think he's a great economist to listen to. Um, he does occasionally even mention uh, Sydney or Australia in terms of housing prices. So there we go. We're back to housing prices in Australia again. Uh, but the reason is because uh, as much as stock picking is really important, as we've seen um, in 2022, macro has really played a large part in terms of valuations of stocks and mm. impacts um, between sectors. So unfortunately, David Rosenberg's research is actually behind a paywall. However, he's quite generous with his tweets. So he does comment on US statistics that are coming out or European statistics, what's happening with the yield curve. And he also has a YouTube channel and he's had a couple of great in interviews with people like Scott Minard, who's a bit of a legend at Guggenheim, um, and uh, Stephanie Pomboy, who's also an interesting economist. So these are all people that I had no idea existed, even with my career, uh, but I find him really, really interesting. You can also see that he pops up on YouTube through CNBC interviews as well. But I think he explains macro really easily and succinctly and um, gives people a better idea what's happening um, economically, particularly in the US. 
which obviously has implications for the rest of the world. For sure it does. And I must admit, I do have a few of these follows uh, in my Twitter feed because of the very reason that I am not adept at these things and understanding these big challenges. So for me, it's a chance for me to get really succinct ideas from really smart people. Um, just, you know, 280 characters, which is really impressive. So that's, that's, that's great. Um, Anir Barn, who is your first one? I, I know this name. So I think there's a similar theme here. <laughs> What's interesting is that Danny went with an economist as number one. Mine is also an economist as number one. And so is Nobel laureate um, uh, Paul Krugman. Uh, Krugman. And uh, yeah, I, I find him interesting. Like, I mean, uh, interesting because he's a very good writer. Mm. Um, and he writes interesting essays. So like, you know, um, and he writes things that um, challenge sort of the in, in where, where it's worth challenging, I guess, the conventional wisdom. So there was this thing about there's the great resignation happening, great resignation happening, great resignation happening, you know. So he's written a piece, you know, and you know, where is the great resignation? There's no such thing as the great resignation. What's going on? Um, so those sort of things he's he's uh, really good at, um, really, I mean, I don't have to say he's smart. He's, of course, very, very smart. And um, he, he, again, as you said, you know, putting things in, you know, really short. He, often he will actually link to an article that he is like an op-ed that he has written, you know, it might be for New York Times. So it might be for you know, the Wall Street Journal or whatever. It's really another way of just finding those articles, right? I mean, I'm not sitting here looking at, you know, flipping through all these newspapers, but it is a really interesting way of getting that information that, you know, he has uh, there to share. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I just find him interesting. It, it, it might, you know, it might not appeal to everybody's sensibilities. I mean, it depends on what type of, you know, the, there are these liberal economists and then these non-liberal economists and God knows what, <laughs> how many different ways of defining uh, economics. Um, I don't understand the subject as well as, you know, which is another reason for following uh, someone that I can at least understand what they're saying and, you know, their language and the way they put it out there. So that's what I really like. Mm. Yeah, it does make a difference. I think what's really important from both of these so far is that um, we don't, I think some people, when they start investing, they kind of follow people that they agree with. And we get those echo chambers, mm. as Danny was talking about. We don't want that. We want other people to contribute ideas into our feed that challenge our opinion. Um, one of the investors that I'm going to bring up is actually closer to home, um, uh, very close to home for me, in fact, uh, Value Down Under on Twitter. And this gentleman is um, from my home state of Victoria, I believe. And um, he's contributed a few articles to RASC. And basically what he does is he talks about AS, primarily ASX listed companies and he takes a top down view on companies and he dives into these deep threads. Um, and so companies that I probably wouldn't look at, like one of them he did was um, Ingham's group, like the chicken uh, business. He talks about tassel which is the seafood business and businesses that are in kind of like these uh, key themes that he's identified as kind of these structurally important industries like in this one being agriculture and food um, and so he brings these deep dives in he doesn't do them that often but when he does they get a lot of engagement and he's always happy to answer questions um, i think there's like a there's a line isn't there where you get to a certain number of followers where you just simply cannot respond um, and he's at that point where he's still up and coming in his twitter profile and it's it's he's a really good follow for asx listed um deep dives and, and and research my second one is also on that too but that's my number one uh, by the way anyone listening along obviously you're going to get lost in all the twitter handles so they're all included in the show notes um which you can download of course um danny back to you number two number two um number two is called qcap and uh he resides in in canada i know that much he, he's previously been in finance so he currently is not in finance but clearly was very high up, I think, in the hedge fund industry or um, one of the major um, investment houses, possibly. He's either been on the buy or the sell side, judging by his feet, probably more on the sell side, actually. Uh, has access to research, so often retweets about companies where he has access to broker research. Uh, but what I love about him is he brings... I think in a very intelligent view to the markets and how investors are responding to the markets, how they're responding to stocks. And it's always interesting. It's also quite fun too. He talks about his young son and how much he loves. He named his three favourite companies as Apple, Tesla and Roblox. And he had to explain to his young son that they couldn't buy anymore because there were problems between the 10 and the two-year yields, treasury yields, which I thought was quite cute. But look, 
I think he's very intelligent. I think his feed is intelligent. I think it's interesting. It's thought provoking. Um, he does have interesting threads. It can be a deep dive into a company as well as something else. For example, he did a really great feed a couple of days ago of all these doomster covers of The Economist magazine and then did a corresponding how much the S&P 500 had actually gone up or down that year. So he makes people think and he does it, I think, in a very interesting way. And I think, Owen, you made a really important point. It's, it's investing is about having an open mind and trying to decipher all these different views that come in. So um, not just getting a, um, an echo chamber back in the views that you want. And um, yeah, I think QCAP's really good for, for making one think. That, um, I'm just looking at that Twitter thread now on those economists uh Covers. It's good, isn't it? It's incredible. Yeah, it's fa- it just goes on and on and on. The browser had to keep reloading. Um, yeah, yeah, that's fantastic. So uh, a great find. I'm, I don't follow them, so it's great. Um, and just the the I love that what people choose because you only get to choose one display picture and cover image on Twitter, and and theirs is when everything isn't going right, go left. Um, <laughs> nice. Um, uh, and Ibon, back to you, mate. Number two, what's on your list? Uh, actually, I follow QCAP, and I think it's awesome. It was an, an awesome uh, follow. I love it. Um, so my next one is actually, like, you know, my first two have got nothing really to do with, in, in, actually most of mine are not directly related to investing because, you know, it's sort of they help with investing, but they're not related directly with investing. Um, they're not stock tips as such. So uh, the second one is John Elrichman. Um, he's basically a, a, a journalist, um, I believe by profession. Um, and he has awesome... Um, takes on the history of tech right so you know he'd have photographs of when the first you know phone came out or you know when the palm pilot came out and what date and he reminds people about stuff that has happened okay this is like the 16th anniversary of this thing or that thing and it's just um i find it very interesting because it gives us context of what has happened in the past and what is it, uh, what is happening now? Uh, so for example, you know, six hours ago, he has posted something about Nokia's 3310 launched 22 years ago. And he says at that time, Nokia was 10 times more valuable than Apple, right? That's just useful for context. It's useful for realizing how stuff changes in this space and, um, you know, in technology, how quickly things can change, what was once valuable. And, you know, Nokia had such a, you know, treasure trove of patents, for example, right? I mean, when you think that IP is something that helps you, um, in, you know, build a moat, well, the IP was not valuable because the ground shifted, right? So, I mean, lots of just interesting things are patents about mouse, uh, um, you know, various interesting videos, so, you know, lots of Steve Jobs videos. It's just, I find it very interesting because it's all random stuff, but they, but he's very careful in how he collects and curates and shares them. So it um, gives me a bit of a you know, blast to the past sort of thing. Uh, and I love it for that. Yeah, that's great. I was just watching one of his top selling video games over the last 30 years, like this graphic. Um, and it's crazy how Minecraft has replaced Tetris. Um, it's just blown it out of the water. So yeah. Um, Wonderful, good wreck, and um, yeah, that Nokia thirty three ten. I remember. I'm I am old enough to remember when that came out, and I just thought it was the greatest thing ever. Um, you could play Snake on it. That game, Snakes. I don't know if you ever saw that, but that was how I lost a lot of my childhood. Um, okay, so my number two is um, another one close to home. It's actually uh, one of our freelancers at Rask, um, and uh, Lachlan Bird Jensen, who I'll put in the show notes. Um, doesn't have that many followers, surprising, under a thousand followers. Um, and the reason that I like him and particularly for new investors, the reason why I wanted to feature him on the list is because he's just really eager to learn. And he's, he's in this mode where he's looking to learn and share really interesting ideas. Um, and so I think these are really valuable people to have if you're on your investing journey, say you're in the first few years of that journey and you're wondering, is anyone else going through this at the same time as I am? Um, and that's really valuable for, for people. And sometimes people don't have that in their lives. They don't have family members or friends that are interested in investing. Um, and so having someone who will respond to you online is actually uh, a really valuable. So locks at number two, him and uh, value down under actually my two, my first two on this list actually do a bulls versus bears thing where they, one of them takes one side of a company and the other one is on the other side and they go back and forth about it. And then everyone else 
um, chimes in over the top. So it's, 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 it's good fun. Um, so that's Lachlan Burr Jensen. Um, I'll put the link into the show notes, of course. Uh, Danny, that was my quick and concise one. Back to you for number three. Yeah, I'm actually going to cheat a little bit here. I'm going to put um, two, two techies mm. uh, together because you only wanted five. <laughs> <laughs> but they come at it um, slightly differently. So I think um, both of them I discovered through, dare I say, that company again, Tesla. Uh, Dan Ives is MD, Managing Director of Wedbush Securities. He's been around in tech for years. He's basically been through the um the, the tech telecom bust of the 2000s. I, he is actually quite well across um, cyber security stocks as well. And he does speak, he gives a lot in terms of media and interviews. And I think he's in the tech space. His head is screwed on in the right direction. Um, Gene Munster from Loop, um, that is basically, he does, uh, he's a fund manager, asset manager. And again, well across Tesla, he is interviewed a lot um, on the likes of CNBC, but he also does his own tubes, uh, YouTubes and deep dives as well for Loop Ventures. And he's very good with Apple, really interesting on his take on Apple and the evolution of that company, um, equally with Tesla, plus some other big tech names. So in that space, that's kind of where I also look to those guys because they seem uh, reasonably well grounded and across the um, the fundamentals of those companies, um, which I think is great because I don't always think they're that easy to analyse, particularly from Australia and particularly given the scale of the companies. I think I've come across Gene a few times and um, Dan, I think he's been on a few podcasts that I've listened to and it's just always really interesting um, to listen to both of them. So those are some great recs and I'm glad you bundled them together so that I'll have to do that with Maya because I, I had six, so I'll do the same. Um, Anirban, back to you, mate. Um, this one I actually, you're about to mention, I do not do not follow, I just checked. So interested to hear yes. why. Well, first of all, you guys are cheating by having six. Well, I only put five. <laughs> <laughs> so, well, that's okay. Uh, you guys can cheat uh, a little bit. That's good. People, people get an extra one. Um, I actually follow both of those, Dan Ives and Gene Munster. Gene Munster is actually wonderful. Dan Ives is also wonderful um yeah i love those too uh and i had a feeling uh, danny's gonna put them on her list so i didn't want to put them in my list <laughs> okay so the third one that i have i think is his he's actually come on the twitter scene maybe in the last couple of years has gotten really out there and popular so his name is chetan puta gunta he's a he's a vc guy he uh, from benchmark uh, benchmark capital um these are this is the company or the venture capital firm that has uh, funded some of the greatest software companies of today's era so so you know um uh, companies like uh, elastic and I, I believe mongodb and many others have actually come out of uh, of benchmarks uh, uh, stable uh, i mean uh, i believe we work is also was funded by benchmark so it's, it's just to give you a slate of things not everything works out or not everything is great um, Chetan is really an awesome follow because he focuses mostly on software stuff. Um, he will he will talk about you know uh, he will put things into context of how sort of the software as a service industry has evolved. He will uh, he will talk about like things that you don't really think about, uh, but you should because this and gives you an insight on how the VCs think. So an example of thing might be uh, something that we generally don't think if we are like working as an analyst is what's the importance or not so you know whether it is important or not to think about uh, professional services offered by a software as a service company right and and there are many examples of this but you know he has many historic examples of where professional services actually have been a great driver although they're only 10 percent of the revenue uh maybe overall revenue but they you know and they're probably just running at you know break even or even a loss they actually drive growth at a company and he has illustrations of that or um he was one of the first people that i saw who was talking about the underlying growth of uh, GCP, which is the Google Cloud uh, Computing Platform, and Azure, which is the Microsoft's Cloud Computing Platform, and sort of the underlying growth rate of cloud. Um, and he had some interesting statistics there and things like that uh, to share. So again, he has really, really uh, you know, insightful, very short 
uh, punchy tweets where he shares really interesting things. Um, and of course, he also shares uh, his love of, for an Indian sweet known as gulab jamun, and he would, uh, which is basically a rounded brown colored sweet for those people who have never had it. And he he talks a lot about that, and there's some interesting jokes that go around about that as well. Um, so I think he's a wonderful follow for anyone who's interested in software. And this is a follow up of that. You know, Benchmark actually makes a lot of their write ups and things like, including their original, um, you know, original pitch like so when when a company is being funded or is going to be funded one of the partners basically writes a pitch to the other people other partners uh at, at benchmark and that pitch is like you know maybe a two-page pitch they would they some of those original pitches uh, i believe for companies like i believe for twilio um and slack also is from their uh, from their stable that they've shared which again gives you a way an insight just to just see how to analyze earlier stage businesses, or just even if, if nothing, just to understand how VCs think about companies, right? And again, so it's just an alternative viewpoint that I find very useful. Mm, there's so much in there. Um, yeah, and I, yeah, Elastic and MongoDB are amongst them, I believe. Um, fantastic uh, follow. I was just looking at some of the, the tweets as well, just breaking down those concepts and, and sharing a lot of those resources, which you'd normally not get access to. So um, that's that's fascinating. I'm actually going to switch to the US as well here, and I'm going to talk about Morgan Housel, who has actually appeared on our podcast. Uh, he's an author of The Psychology of Money and a few others. Um, Morgan um, is like a prolific writer, um, blogger turned author, um, and just a really good thinker, come from the Motley Fool and then moved over to Collaborative Fund, uh, where he's still today, still writing. Um, and Danny, I'm sure you could appreciate this being an author yourself. He he wrote his book originally as a blog and then it got downloaded and that's what convinced him to then go and put in all the effort to write the blog because we've talked in the past about how much effort goes into writing a book. Um, so why would you follow Morgan? Morgan doesn't tweet that often, but when he does, he just, he just like picks the things that you think and he just brings common sense to it. Um, and he actually has this, this thing out, this tweet out recently. Uh, he said, we're definitely heading towards a recession. The only thing that's uncertain is the timing, location, duration, magnitude, and policy response. And then he followed up later after that. And he said, it's astounding how many people took this seriously. Um, and so I think this is, it may have been, um, yeah, he may have said this is kind of like an April fool's joke, but, um, yeah, he's, he's totally not the guy that would ever do that. So um, it's crazy because he's got 300,000 followers now. I remember when he was like 10 or 20,000. And um, yeah, he's just, a, he's just a really clear thinker. If you listen to, if you follow his tw uh, Twitter, you can get the, um, a link through to where he writes and everything like that on the blog. So definitely one of those must follows for me on Twitter um, out of the US. Danny, that's my number three. Back to you. Cool. Uh, well, speaking of people that have 300,000 followers, if I had to have one of those as well, I'm going to try and not muller his name. Charlie Bilello, I assume he's Italian. Um, mm -hmm. And basically he's founder and CEO of Compound Advisors. He's an investor, writer, everything. Uh, he has started a YouTube as well. Basically he does the most amazing summaries of data. And they can be produced in charts or uh, summary pieces. That the one I'm going to refer to is one that came out about 13 hours ago. So this is we're recording Thursday, so Wednesday their time, and it's a summary of how the best performing stocks in the S&P 500 over the last 30 years. And I think that's a really interesting journey for investors to. Of course, you can look at the performance and weep if you weren't in them, but that's really not the point of the exercise. It's really to look at how stocks, different stocks have changed and moved in terms of their significance in the market. And again, it's it's all about the education process of what can you learn from this as an investor, which stocks have longevity and uh, which stocks like the, the changing aspects in terms of um you know the the moving companies some that were great and no longer great and also too it's just a great set of name for people if they're looking to do any stock picking in the us it's an incredible list of names that come up um some of which are very very well recognized some of which aren't but um yeah, he just does, I would just put it as amazing uh, macro commentary, commentary on the markets, all presented uh, 
um, like in terms of graphics. Um, and uh, I, I think he's a really interesting thinker as well. And uh, just incredible, the data collation this guy has, the, the stats that he comes up with are quite mind blowing. Um, so I think he's really, really interesting. I'm sorry, it's kind of another macro one, but I'm, I'm always hunting for, uh, as, as you say, common sense, because common sense is not very common. Um, and any of these people that can collate such great amounts of data is great for getting the, the thought juices going. Um, mm. Yeah. Mm. It's um, having macro views scales well too, right? Like if you're uh, if you've got three hundred thousand followers, it's easier to talk about something big picture um, than it is to talk about some company that maybe only a few of your followers have heard of. But just to just to highlight, this is from April nineteen ninety two to Ma- March two thousand and twenty two. The top five companies on uh, Charlie's list uh, uh, in order: are Amazon, Monster Beverage, Nvidia, Pool Corp and uh, Altria, which is the tobacco business. So those are the top five. And Tesla does get a mention at number 29 out of 30 with the highest annualized return. So you two will be very happy with that. Um, and Ivan, we're almost at the end. Number four for you, mate. Number four for me, okay. Um, number four for me is, um, this gets interesting specifics. It's someone I should have found um, while uh, you know researching and thinking about Tesla, so and as a person I've interviewed uh, for the Seven Investings podcast, um, a gentleman named Mayut Taker, um, he works for Zacks, and he's he's a finance nerd. Maybe if he doesn't mind me calling him that, um, he goes deep into the numbers, and he's not just a numbers guy in the sense that he understands the business. And then he's able to relate the business with the numbers in a beautiful way. Uh, one of his favorite metrics, for example, is the return on invested capital. And he has, you know, he, he does research and it'll show how the return on invested capital, for example, a company like Tesla has been steadily increasing and how it's, you know, has been a, uh, it can be a forward um, indicator of strong performance to come. Um, so I, I, I've, I really learned a lot about, just the way he sort of you know peels through the financials uh, of any company that he follows and he really runs a, you know his own personal portfolio looks very concentrated to me uh, but you know he's happy to run a concentrated portfolio mostly in disruptors like and he owns things like i believe square and uh, you know beyond uh, beyond meat and tesla uh, and, and things like that but he's he's a wonderful follow if you want to get into the nitty gritty of things so if there's a company that you like and uh, and you want somebody to give you good research or somebody, you know, point you at least towards um, ideas and how to think about it and uh, how to look at a company using metrics that are, you know, not just your standard PE or, you know, price to sales or EV to say, you know, and enterprise value to sales, or even like just EBITDA and things like that. If you want to think a little bit deeper, he's a great guy uh, to, to look at. And, uh, you know, he's also very good at explaining conceptual um, uh, things. So again, I find his, his the, the mix of, you know, taking sort of the, the financial lingo and, Com- which is very hard to apply actually to disruptive companies uh, and then applying it to disruptive companies that I think is, is really where he shines. So, you know, um, he's again, a lovely follow uh, for that reason. He's again, underfollowed. I've tried to find people who I think are underfollowed, um, but, you know, I think he should be followed more uh, than he is. You know, sometimes it gets a little nerdy for people, but, but again, I, I've, I quite find it enjoying actually. It's very enjoying to me. I feel like investing is one of those things where you're happy to be called nerdy. Um, I think it's endearing and I can see what you mean. There's like a lot of forecast margin analysis and stuff in here. Um, but I've also got included the link to that interview with the, the transcript and everything there as well. Um, fantastic follow there, mate. Um, mine is probably not underfollowed, but probably underfollowed when you think about there is so much content coming out of this guy. And that's our Patrick O'Shaughnessy, um, the host of Invest Like the Best. Um, former CEO of um, O'Shaughnessy Asset Management, which is um, the firm his dad started, I believe. Um, he's, you know, in podcast invest like the best has connected millions and millions of people with um, the the international leaders of investment research and investment thinking. Um, some of my favorite interviews of all time have come from his podcast, and he sh- is gracious to share those on Twitter. 
And, you know, he's interviewed the likes of Morgan Housel, which you just mentioned. Um, I feel like Dan Ives might have even been on there. Um, there's a bunch of different investors that not just from the US, but around the world that have been profiled on the show. And he since turned the podcast into a business called Colossus, um, which now has more than just, you know, equities research and all of that. It's um, crypto, it's like, like blockchain technologies and a bunch of other stuff in their VC. So um, a really fascinating, fascinating follow on Twitter. If you don't already, this yeah, he's like a must follow for anyone that's looking at like the, the pointiest end of like where theory meets application in markets. Um, it's a really, really fascinating, uh, I guess, channel to subscribe to as well. Invest like the best. He approaches it from a quantitative perspective because that's his background, but he's very open-minded. I remember when he had uh, David Gardner, who's the Motley Fool co-founder on the show, he said something to the effect of... Um, I think I brought this up in a podcast recently. Like he's the way David invests is diametrically opposed to the way Patrick invests, but he was still able to get so many great insights out of him for that conversation. So um, fantastic follow on Twitter and the podcast too, highly recommended. So that's Patrick O'Shaughnessy. Um, I think we're up to lucky number five, Danny, for you. Um, this one I do not follow. So um, I'm interested to hear what you have to say. Yeah, so cross-border capital, this is actually uh, a guy called Michael Howell who started at Salomon Brothers and he's probably the leading analyst commentator on global liquidity around the world. And Michael was our strategist at Bearings in the 1990s and it's just producing uh, a different slant on looking at our global financial system. Uh, his tweets are interesting. Uh, he does share quite a lot as well on LinkedIn. Uh, you can He is interviewed a lot. Uh, it's not always the easiest to get your brain around at the beginning, but given that central banks have played such a massive role in our financial system, particularly post, well, it basically has been post the Volcker era of the early 80s, uh, Michael has an incredible understanding of global liquidity. And it is very interesting once you start looking at the comparisons between market performances and global liquidity. So it's just a different slant on trying to understand, again, probably a little bit too much big picture stuff. It's always that balance of trying to pick, um, you know, other people. But, um, you know, I think uh, Michael is uh, one of a kind in the world. And uh, I mentioned that uh, chap earlier, George Noble, he also cites him as one of a kind. He writes for the FT. He's interviewed by Bloomberg. He's a really big fish, but very approachable. And uh, again, would just bring a completely different view to how to look at investing in finance. So Danny, you you worked with him, is that correct? Yeah, yeah. He was our global strategist at Bearing Securities in the 90s. Yeah. Oh, yeah great. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've used him in my books and he's very approachable. I've written articles about some of his work because he does, he he opens up and does presentations um, to the to the public. And uh, it is a little bit hard sometimes to get the mind around, but it is really, really important because there is so much global debt in the system. Mm. And, you, you know, it, it sort of begs the question, he just puts forward a different thesis of how the story is going to, to, to end. Um, and uh, again, just a completely different perspective that, you know, rates are going back up to 12% and, you know, et cetera, he would put a proposition forward. Well, that's just not going to happen. <laughs> Fair enough. I like it. So that's um, lucky number five from you. Uh, Nibba, we're up to your last one, mate. Um, this is one that I do follow and um, I love the deep dives. Yes. So this, this is a great one, actually. So there's a guy called Peter Offringa. Um, he runs a site called uh, Software Stack Investing. Um, he, he's, he's, got a, uh, he's been a CTO of a tech company in the past. Um, and I think what he does is he shares his own personal portfolio um, online. But that's not the, the point. The point really is what he's really, really interesting is that he can really write in detail 
and explain um, software concepts, software ideas, um, you do, and make it easily accessible. At least, you know, uh, if you read it, you know, a few times, you definitely get your head around what he's talking because he, he does a lot of detailed coverage for things. Uh, and he covers some very interesting modern software, what I call the modern sort of software companies, uh, is really good because it also comes with a lot of historical um you know, background as to how, you know, even things like, you know, the sales motions and how the sales motions have changed in software companies and, you know, how uh, things like developer mindshare, how it's, you know, why it's important and how do you evaluate that? Those sort of things, you know, there are a lot of subtleties there that he talks about. So I've, I find it really interesting to sort of get the take of someone who has been out there and has done that kind of thing. And, uh, you know, uh, so if you're interested in companies like, you know, uh, uh, like Datadog, as an example, mm. uh, then he's a great, great follow. Um, you know, uh, you know, again, I think he talks about MongoDB and, and companies like Twilio and things like that. Snowflake. Uh, yeah, again, a snowflake, yeah. So it's again, he follows some very interesting companies, and he has really, really a, a wonderful take. Uh, that you know, you don't have to agree with his take as, as an example, but I mean, there's something that one can learn from it, and it's, it's really, really well done. So I, I really, I really am a big fan of what Peter does. I find people like this have a strategic advantage or a structural advantage over other investors because the, this guy is like a software engineer, right? So he understands like the the depths of the intricacies of engineering and what it actually takes to scale a, a development team what it takes to make product and if you think that things like you know b2b software is only um more and more becoming more and more complex you want to follow someone like this who can just break it apart for you and be like this is what matters and this is how it relates to that thing that's going on over here as well um fantastic yeah um software stack investing the website too brilliant Excellent. Um, so I'm glad you brought that one up. Um, my last one, I'm going to cheat again. I'm going to cheat twice here and I'm going to actually bring three into the mix. and I'm going to try and squeeze it all into my last number five. So it's actually um, Brian Feroldi, uh, who's actually going to appear on the Australian Investors Podcast in the next couple of weeks. Uh, Brian basically does one graphic a day and he shares that. And it's just, you know, it could be very simple. Like he did this graphic where... Um, it showed basically a simple plane and all of the information falling down and all of the value from the stock market accruing to long-term investors and only a little bit going to people that trade daily. Uh, 10K Diver, uh, which is just a, a Twitter handle and a, it's just a brilliant Twitter handle and it's a podcast and they do videos there where you can um, just see them un, unfold and un, unroll really um, complicated financial concepts, like even like correlation and how correlation should be measured in portfolios and how we're taught it in academia versus reality. It's actually a really good, um, a really good Twitter handle for people that want to go beyond just simple, like kind of like surface level analysis. And then um, MBI, mostly borrowed ideas. Uh, this is a, a website that you can go to, to where he, I believe it's a, he, I could be wrong, um, does just deep dives on companies and just really gets into the weeds on different concepts around investing. Um, I think it's a fantastic one. He's done one recently on Ethereum. So it's kind of like a go anywhere approach. Um, it's similar to software stack investing, probably a little bit less targeted in terms of it's not just software, but a great follow. Um, and I, I, I think I squeezed all three of them in, in about a minute there. So I think I hit my target. Um, so all up, I've got eight. Uh, Anirban, you've got five. Danny, you've got uh, six. I think these are some great follows to, to kick off um, anyone's journey into the investor Twitter Rati. There are heaps more. And in particular, there are two that I will call out separately, which is AU underscore share Plicity and 7A Mahanti, which are the two handles of my wonderful guests here today. Um, you can follow them. I'll give a special shout out for Danny. Danny covers everything from like what's going on on the ASX to what's going on in global markets. Um, really good follow. Retweets, really important stuff that you should know about if you're learning. The books are obviously available at shareplicity.com.au, right, Danny? Yep, that's correct. Yep, fantastic. We'll have all the links in the show notes. And um, everyone, I don't think, needs an introduction to uh, Seven Investing uh, near Barn, but um, they can head to seveninvesting.com to get more of your podcast interviews that you've done or any of your write-ups too. Yep. Beautiful. All right, guys, 
I really appreciate you taking the time today. This is all about helping other investors learn. If you want to reach out to myself or any of um, either of these two guys, you can do that on Twitter. Uh, we'd love, and we will actually respond. Unlike everyone that um, Anirban's tried to contact, we will actually respond and we will say hello. So uh, please reach out to us. And um, I just want to say thanks again, guys, for giving me 10 or 11 people to follow on Twitter. <laughs>